Hello, everyone. If you are just logging in and joining us tonight, uh, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're listening from today. Uh, my name is Meghna. Uh, I'm here in Seattle uh, at Book Larder um, here in the Fremont neighborhood. It's sunny. I think it's probably in the mid 50s right now. Um, and we are so excited to join um, Hedy McKinnon and Aran Gliaga as they demonstrate how to make some dumplings from uh, Hedy's new book, To Asia With Love. Uh, I'm just going to give us a few more minutes to get logged in, uh, wait for folks to get settled into the room. Uh, but like I said, if you would like to um, let me know where you're listening from tonight, you can drop a message into the chat function on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please note that if you select the all panelists and attendees option, um, then everyone tonight will be able to see your message. Hello from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Oakland, California, Finney, New York, listening from Japan. Wow. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so grateful that, um, that you all are here joining us tonight. Um, again, my name is Magna. I'm here at Book Larder in Seattle. We are a community cookbook store. And um, tonight's event is going to be about um, Hedy McKinnon's brand new book, To Asia With Love. It's a beautiful book. Um, and we do have signed copies here. I will drop a link into the chat uh, for anyone that's interested in purchasing a copy from us today. Um, Hedy is going to be joined by Aran Glioga, and both of them will be making dumplings. Um, I believe they are mushroom and asparagus dumplings, and um, they will be gluten-free, although um, not all of the recipes from the book are, are gluten-free. So um, we'll speak to that a little bit tonight. Um, at the end of the event, we will leave a little bit of time for question and answer. So if you have any questions, please do drop them into the Q&A button at the very bottom of the screen. Um, that will help me to, um, to see them all in one place and to field them towards the end of the event. Um, all right, so the book again can be ordered at booklarder.com. I will put a link at the, in the chat for anyone interested in purchasing. And we are going to get started here in um, just a moment um, with Hedy and Aran. Uh, Hedy McKinnon is an internationally renowned cookbook author and food writer. In 2015, Hedy relocated from Sydney to New York uh, City, where she writes about food and runs pop-up food events and workshops. She's the author of three cookbooks in addition to, to, in addition to Asia with Love, uh, Community, Salad Recipes from Arthur Street Kitchen, Neighborhood, Salads, Sweets, and Stories from Home and Abroad, and family, vegetarian comfort food to nourish every day. In 2017, she launched her independent multicultural food journal, Peddler, and in 2019, created the podcast, The House Specials. Uh, Hedy will be joined in conversation and in demonstration by Aran Goyoga, who is a Seattle-based Basque country born and raised cookbook author, food stylist, and photographer. Her work focuses on the emotional component of food and everyday life through visual stories. Her second cookbook, Canal at Vanille, Nourishing Gluten-Free Recipes for Every Meal and Mood, was published in 2019 and has been recognized by the New York Times, Food 52, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, Washington Post, NBC News, and more. Her first cookbook, Small Plates and Sweet Treats, My Family's Journey to Gluten-Free Cooking, was published in 2012. She has styled and photographed multiple other cookbooks. Um, so welcome, Hedy, and welcome, Aran. Thank you, everyone who is joining us and tuning in today. Um, I'd love to invite the two of you back on screen, and we will get this started. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was still trying to get, still trying to unmute myself. My computer is really far away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> know, it's, so, uh, it's, it's funny not being able to see everybody, but thank you for joining. Yeah. And Aaron, have you, have you got some cooking to do? Judging uh, by those post it notes. Uh, yeah. I, oh. <laughs> um, Hedy, congratulations on this book. Thank you. This is Super Terry, I was just um, reading, you know how I like to read like little 
hard to yeah live. yeah I love it finding empathy and salad that made me so emotional I know that one was like the sh one of the shorter essays in the book there's a few essays um with every chapter I, I wrote an essay and that one was a really short one and somebody asked me to read it um on a zoom call recently and I actually cried because I didn't I kind of I read it because it was short but I forgot that it was all about my mom as most of this book is <laughs> about my mom but it was just kind of about me like becoming a more compassionate person through cooking which um is you know I guess the power of food and also kind of ties how you started um focused on salads not necessarily yeah. uh anchored in your Chinese heritage yeah I mean, I, I learned almost everything that I know about food through salad, which is kind of crazy and unlikely, I think, given my upbringing, given what I kind of do now, even though I still love salad so much. But, um, you know, there's something in salad that, that um, it, it, for a person learning to cook, you know, it's that composition of flavors, the use of spices, the, the, the search for textures. I mean, there's so much to learn from a salad and then the other stuff for me personally. So... Um, it'll always be a, a very important meal for, in my life. <laughs> I love seeing the focus, how it's gone from, you know, here you are, daughter of Chinese immigrants living in Australia, you cook healthy salads, vegetarian, sort of like what you yeah. think. And then, you know, you kind of start narrowing down your books on, yeah, like what is inside of you and your heritage. Yeah. Well, honestly, like before I started cooking, I didn't know what was inside of me. And that sounds strange since I've only been doing it for 10 years. But honestly, food has really been my gateway to understanding myself. And so the journey that has been described in my first four books has really been me discovering that kind of at the same time as me sharing it with the world. Um, I don't think if I even, if I didn't start cooking, I don't know if I would be at this spot right now in terms of embracing the person I am, my cultural heritage, um, you know, my, my, my parents and the, their journey um, to Australia. Like, I don't know if, I mean, I might have, but I, I don't know. This is, this is the journey that I've taken. And um, it's been, food is, and has played, I mean, certainly I'm sure for you too, it's play, played such a big role in mm -hmm. allowing me to understand myself and not only understand, but to be, to actually love the person I am, because it's something I really struggled with growing up. And I, I write about that in the book is this kind of search for identity and understanding your identity. And food really gave that to me. Um, so, and I think that from the reaction to the book, both in Australia and over the last few days, it's a very similar thing. I mean, no matter where you're from, you could be Chinese, Korean, Greek, Italian, you know, Basque, you know, this kind of understanding um, that food has played such a big role for a lot of people in understanding who they are. Um, and so it's been one of the most amazing things for me, releasing this book is connecting with those first in generation, um, Americans, Australians, English people, you know, like people who grew up in this different world to the world that their parents grew up in and perhaps kind of teetered by, between several cultures growing up themselves and so I think that's kind of been an area that doesn't hasn't been talked about that much is um, you know like I talk about in the book also you know that the burden of assimilation people talk about that a lot for immigrants who you know like say for my mum mom and dad's generation like they moved to a western country um, and had to you know learn a new language and learn a new way of life and a new lifestyle but really they didn't have to assimilate the way we did. I mean, my mum still doesn't really speak great English. And, you know, she's lived in Australia for 50 years. So for us, like being the next generation, there was a different burden of assimilation, you know, like really being caught between those two cultures and needing to straddle both in a way that was convincing, but kind of not convincing to anyone. Um, and then and I think that story has really resonated with a lot of people. It's it's not a big deal struggle at all. You know, it's not, you know, we're not being killed on the streets, but it's just an internal, um, and, and the way you see yourself is so important. You know, your identity and 
the way you see yourself and respect yourself is a really important personal journey that only you can only get there yourself. You know, other people can't make you feel that way. So, um, wow, we went, we launched right into it, but <laughs> I, I wonder because of time reasons if we should start cooking. I want to yes. more about you know. I want you to tell me more about dumplings in your life. Mm -hmm. Dumplings, uh, how your mom made dumplings, where they're. Okay, so, um, I mean, dumplings in our house were like celebration food. So there was not, there are not things that we eat every day. Like now we kind of eat them, like in our house, we kind of eat them like for lunch or for dinner or whenever. But in, in growing up, we only ate them for birthdays, um, the Lunar New Year, like celebration food. And my mom really only made one type of dumpling. It was a very regional dumpling from um, where from Jiangsan, which is a, an area in southern China. So um, it's and I have found out recently it's called gok jay. So it's a um, it's actually a gluten free um, mm. it's actually a gluten free uh, dumpling wrapper, and it's made of like wheat starch, which it has no wheat in it. It's gluten free. So. Um, wheat starch and some potato starch and I think it's rice flour but it's a really hard dough to make it's actually in the first issue of Peddler and I've only ever made it a few times and I still haven't perfected it because when I it's a steamed dumpling and um when I make it it still has some cracks in it which you know you can still eat it but it's a really difficult dough to make I made it for Lunar New Year this year um it's on my Instagram and it wasn't perfect my mum saw it and she was like trying to be really supportive and said oh they look good but I saw some cracks and I was like I know and I did everything that you told me to so so those are the dumplings that we ate growing up and ironically I'm like the only one in my family that really loves it like my brother and sister don't love it um, but there are many different types of dumplings and you know I did a dumpling issue for peddlers I mean all around the world people have you know their own brand of dumplings and so the ones that I make mostly nowadays are the ones um, are made of like a really simple flour and hot, it's, I call it a hot water dough. Um, and so the hot water, and that's when you, I use just AP flour. So um, the hot water actually is really kind of um, pivotal for that, that particular dough because it cooks the flour, the gluten in the flour a little bit. So it just makes it easier to roll out. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the dough that we, I normally use now in my everyday cooking. It's really easy. I've always got the ingredients and, you know, I, sometimes I do start making it at 11 o'clock and eat it for lunch. Like it's a, for me, like rolling, it, it does take time. I'm not going to lie and say it's something you can just throw together in 10 minutes. It's not that type of recipe. Although if you had pre-made, you know, like dumpling wrappers from the supermarket, you could throw it together quite easily. Um, but it's, you know, for me, it's like meditation to like, you know, do the dough and then roll it and crimp. It, it's like meditation to me. So mm -hmm. I absolutely adore it. I always have some in the freezer that I've made or sometimes I buy them, but um, they freeze really well. You fill them and then you freeze them. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is like I grew up with very traditional um, fillings like you know when I became vegetarian it would be like shiitake mushrooms water chestnuts maybe napa cabbage some carrots like very traditional kind of a very Asian um, flavored um, filling but now for me I kind of go rogue with the fillings and in the book there is um, I was so this is like my most it was like I was so excited when I thought of it, it was like this um dumplings by the seasons so it's actually I'll get the book and show you it's actually um seasonal dumplings using seasonal vegetables so they're all the different um they're all the different sorry it's a bit dark in New York it's eight o'clock um but they're all the different so it's like using like so what you'd get at markets and other things that I put inside dumplings are leftovers so I do leftovers quite a lot um if I have like some sort of salad with like leg legumes, I'll like chop that up. And the, the only thing to remember about a filling is, A, it can't be too wet because if it's too wet, it'll break your wrapper. And the other thing is you need something that's going to bind it a little bit. So for meat eaters, it's fine because meat is your binder. 
um, and, it, and meat fillings are usually way easier to work with because they stay together. The challenge with a lot of vegetarian and vegan fillings is that they'll fall apart. So the I use things like a potato. So if you cook up one potato and just mash it up, if you put that through your filling, it'll just help everything stay together. Um, other things like ricotta cheese, um, any kind of like creamy cheese, even like sour cream, if that's what you've got, just a little bit of that will just help the filling stay together. And that's mainly for, um, the vegetarian and vegan fillings. The other thing I would do is add, like today we're doing, I'm just gonna turn my, my cooker on. Um, okay. Today we're doing a herby mushroom um, filling. And in that, I will add some breadcrumbs. Um, so breadcrumbs works as a way of binding. Also like my mum uses cornstarch to bind even when she's doing a meat filling. So, um, yeah, so there's like some of the little, the little tricks. The other thing I will say is today we're making the gluten-free um, wrapper. By the way. Which is... <laughs> Sorry? I'm going to start. Making... Okay, me too. Okay. Okay, so well, we'll tell you what's in. So this is a, a mushroom base. You can use any mushrooms you want. I'm using oysters, oyster mushrooms, and shiitakes. What are you using, Aaron? So we're going to put in, uh, this is just one um, shallot that's been finely chopped. So this is one of the fun things that we can do because we're at home, we can actually cook. You can't really, can, can people? Oh yeah, you can use your... So we're just going to soften that. Now the gluten-free dough has had a lot of interest online. <laughs> People are pretty excited by this. Now I really developed this recipe. I'm not gluten-free and my family's not gluten-free, but a lot of people were asking me, um, and there are a lot of gluten-free um, starch-based um, dumpling wrappers in Asian cultures. And, you know, like a lot of the ones that you'll eat at dim sum, like the hagal, that's a gluten-free wrapper. But for me, they're really hard to make. I wanted something that was more, um, that felt more flour based for this one. So I don't really know. I was interested in talking to around about the, um, the, flour, the flowers and the starches because this is just what I came up with through a lot of experimentation. I really like the texture of this. It's still quite a delicate dough um, to work with. And so I've made it several times this week because I hadn't made it for a little while. And, um, but it's, it, the texture of it is so good. Like to eat it, it's absolutely amazing. It's such a yummy dough. It is. I, um, I've made it twice before just to get ready for this. Can you hear me yeah. by the way? I don't have your yeah. little. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, and uh, I was surprised how elastic it was. Yeah. Um, and um, the thing with, um, the thing with uh, the gluten-free doughs that works really well, like you said, with the boiled water, is that with tapioca starch, uh, when you cook it, so you're essentially cooking it with the hot water, yeah. it, it activates, it becomes really elastic and yeah. like, develops the strands. Yeah. It almost acts like sampling gum without having. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, that's a really good way of, making a gluten-free dough or noodle kind of dough that it's not doesn't have something gum yeah so i've just put in um about i think it's nine ounces i still think in grams i think it's like 250 grams nine ounces of finely chopped mushrooms and uh one clove of chopped garlic do you want them to be kind of colder to fill or does it matter? Um, I mean, it's better if it's colder. But yeah, the other day I used a filling that was kind of warm and it was fine. So I think it's good to cook this first and then try and cool it off a little. Do you cook them? Do you cook the mushrooms down at home? Yeah, I cook them down until they're like, until all the moisture releases and cooks back in. I mean, I think my mixture is not going to be that liquidy because 
I'm using shiitakes and oysters, oyster mushrooms, which don't have as high a water content as say a button mushroom or a cremini. What are you using today? I'm using oyster. Oh, okay, cool. So, um, and then tell us a little bit about the different cooking methods. So, you know, a pot oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, pot stickers and the... Yeah, so pot stickers um, have many different names in different Chinese dialects. In Cantonese, we call them like war tip. Um, and they are kind of cooked twice. So they, but so for those, for pot stickers, you need the dumpling to have a bottom because that's what's going to get nice and golden for you. So you fry it first and then they're steamed. So mm -hmm. the steaming portion is cooking the rest of the dough and the inside if it's a raw, um, if it's a raw filling. Now the advantage of um, almost all vegan and vegetarian fillings is that it's less cooking time because there's no meat that needs to be cooked. So that's always the advantage. Um, so that's pot stickers. Then there's steaming, of course, which is, you know, kind of everybody knows how to steam, right? You just, I usually use um, a bamboo steamer because the bamboo steamer has its own flavor, um, which is very uh, nostalgic to me. So it, it, and it kind of does flavor the food. And I, I love that smell. It does remind me of like, say a dim sum restaurant. Um, so they're steaming. And then the other way is boiling. Um, for boiling, you normally need a thicker dough because it's, it's of all the methods of cooking, it's the most vigorous um, because it's like moving around in the water. So if you're making a homemade dough for that, I would use cold water because a cold water um, dough, so the same amount of water, but a cold water dough would, is generally thicker because you just can't roll it out as thin. Um, and that usually stays together more. So it's better for boiling. It's not the end of the world. I mean, I don't like a lot of rules in cooking, but there you can really use any temperature water, but really based on how you want to cook it. The hot water dough is great for pot stickers because you can get it nice and thin. Um, it's kind of like a, the hot water dough is kind of like an all round, all rounder, which is why I love it. And we're going to pan fry and steam these ones, right? That's yeah. So for this dough, this gluten-free dough, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do any boiling. I think I tried to boil it once and it didn't go that well. Um, so for this one, you could probably, you, you can either steam it or you can do pot stickers with it. Um, the great thing about it is sometimes because it is, you know, it's gluten-free, so it's quite, it's not as elastic as say um, uh, an AP flour dough. You can, even if there's like a tiny like little cracks in it, after it's cooked, they, it kind of comes back together. Um, so it, it's a really, and that happened to me several times this week when I was like, I sometimes tend to work it a bit too vigorously. And, um, you know, they had tiny flecks of um, little kind of cuts in them. And, and they when they steam, they kind of, you know, melts back together. And that's probably from having the starches um, in there. So I'm just going to put some salt and pepper. I did that too. Um... I can't really show you. I want to see if it's on the table. Mine are pretty. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have any like much moisture in mine at all. Okay, so Is I'm that... gonna stop mine. If that's okay. Yeah. And then. I made the asparagus filling. Yeah. Um, I think it calls for feta, right? Uh huh. Yeah. I, um, because I don't. I'm not doing dairy. I used uh, vegan cream cheese to bind it all together. Oh, how was that? Delicious. So here we've got some herbs. Um, I only had cilantro and scallions in my fridge, so that's what I'm using. Uh, mm. you know, a ton of them. And I'm using gluten-free uh, panko. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I often use, I like, I like the gluten-free panko actually. I've just got, I think this is regular panko today. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see, it's a little steamy. Yeah, let's just put that aside for a little bit to. And the other thing I'm going to say is this is a general rule about making dumplings. Always taste your filling um, because what we want with our filling is for it to be quite salty. And it could almost taste too salty um, before you eat it. Um, be before you, it could almost taste at this stage too salty. And that's probably good because once you, you wrap it, you know, there's no salt in most dumpling wrappers. So the, you need this to be quite salty to kind of counteract the blandness of the wrapper. So that's something, and, it, and if it's meat, obviously you have to kind of cook it off a little bit. Um, that's always a good tip with dumpling making. Okay. I really love salt, so I'm going to go a bit more. And, and I want to love about like a filling like this is it really kind of shows you different ways of thinking about dumplings, like not feeling like, oh, I need to know so much about what to put in, um, what goes into a dumpling. I mean, obviously there are traditional dumplings that certain things go into, but um, you know, for a home cook, you can kind of, you know, use your imagination. So I'm just gonna put that aside. I'm ready. Okay. So we're gonna move on to the, so my, my, my clear bowl broke, so mm -hmm. I don't have one right now. It's already mixed in. Okay. I, I was, I mean, I, I'm no expert in dumplings, so um, excuse my, ignorant question, but I was a little surprised there was no salt in the actual dough. Is that- Yeah, is that um, I don't know why there isn't. I just don't use it. And because the traditional one, we don't use salt in the dough. So mm -hmm. um, for, the tr for this gluten-free one, I just did the same thing. But I, I suspect, I don't know, someone might know the actual sciences, but I suspect it's because most dumpling fillings are very salty. And so having like that blandness provides a good balance count counterbalance to that. Um, that's what I think anyway. So the dough itself has three flours or three or two starches. Well, they're all, all actually called flour. But I think I think of tapioca as more of a starch. Um, so there's tapioca flour or Bob's Red Mill tonight. Um, millet flour, and I love the flavor that millet flour adds to it, and sweet rice flour, otherwise known as, I call it glutinous rice flour, because that's what we call it in Chinese, but, um, so they're the three flours or starches. I actually um, didn't have any millet, so I use sorghum, which are kind of- How does that, yeah, I was going to ask you, is there something, what flours do you think would be a good substitute for millet if you didn't have millet. Mm -hmm. I know I'm asking you because I think you're the expert in this. <laughs> good one. Sorghum, so, okay. And then um, also like if you don't, it's not quite the same thing, but the sweet uh, white rice flour, the glutinous flour, if you yeah. don't have it in a pinch, you could use more tapioca starch. It okay. Acts a little bit. I know it, it doesn't sound like they would be similar, but they kind of act. Oh, no, they are similar. I think they're similar definitely because they have that kind of, um, that, that starchy feel to it. The gumminess. And then yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, in the book you say um, psyllium husk, but you don't say if it's a like husk, like the whole husks or if it's a powder. So I used the powder. So, yeah, I'm using powder tonight too. I think when I tested it, I used the husk, um, but you did have that great comment that if you're using powder, and I did find the same thing when I was doing it this week. Um, the, the recipe says to use three quarters a cup of um, boiling, just boiled water, just boiled, just cooled for like 30 seconds so you don't burn yourself. And then two tablespoons of um, cooler water just to kind of cool the mixture down. But I did actually use, I think two extra teaspoons of water um, because I was just using the husk powder. So that's a good thing to remember. And the, um, what was that? I was gonna say something else about the water. Okay. so. I always use scales and I'm, I'm pretty sure you would recommend this too, right? Um, in every American cookbook, you got to put your cups in, but 
I love scales. It's really important for all baking, particularly gluten-free baking. I, I feel like I even measure my water because I made this a couple of times this week. The first time I didn't measure the water and I just used cups. And you know, when you fill your cup and it's sloshing around, so like some probably it wasn't exact and that dough was quite dry and I had to keep adding water as I was working with it. So I would recommend if you have scales to use them because it does make a humongous difference um, just to get it right from the beginning rather than go, oh no, this is too dry. Now I have to add more. I don't know how much more to add. Um, so that's just a tip that I'm sure you hear cooks say it all the time, but it really is like scales are just, I don't I, really cook anything without scales. <laughs> that if you take two different measurements or different brands and if you weigh the same ingredient with them there yeah. might be five to ten gram difference yeah for some recipes it's not at all but yeah it can be so, it is and, and particularly like with the way you you if you fill your cups for example i mean i don't i'm not very good at filling my cups i'm sure i do it the wrong way but you know a scales takes away all you know any kind of margin of error you're going to have um, so to the dough, um, this is half a cup or 100 grams of millet flour. And then this is the 100 grams, half a cup of tapioca flour. And this is 125 grams or one cup of the glutinous rice or sticky, sweet sticky rice flour. Is that what it's called? Sweet sticky rice? I'm not used to that description. Okay. So you have chopsticks, which I look, I have before. Oh, that's okay. I just always use chopsticks. People think it's like a gimmick, but it's oh, kind it's of just what I cook with. Um, so then we're going to add three quarter cup of boiling water or just boiled water, or what is this in, um, in grams is a hundred, uh, sorry, in, in milliliters is 185. So I'm going to get my I'm just going to fill this up. Hold on. I have hot water from my tap and I have a boiling water function on my tap. So I'm going to use that. I'm going. I'm, I have started. Okay. I wonder if people are um, cooking along. I can't see the chat. No. I don't, can't really see it either. It, it's kind of, I don't know if they had, uh, uh, unless they've got the book, they could cook along. I don't think we um, shared the recipe. Okay. It's 185. Oh, okay, got it. I have 185, but I think I'm gonna need a little bit more. Of the hot? I used the uh, husks or the powder, sorry. Oh, I forgot to put my husk in. Oops. Oops. Lucky you mentioned that. Yeah, you need that. Although I wonder actually if it would make a huge difference because there's so much starch with hot water in here. Yeah. And then we're going to add two tablespoons of um, just room temperature water. So I'll attempt to do this without spilling it. And you never get messy like I'm getting. You ever like go in there with your hands? Yeah, I do. I will. I'm going to do it right now. Just be careful, guys, when you do the. Um, I had a heart attack because when I first wrote this book, I had boiling water. So that was the instructions. This for that for this recipe and the um, the AP flour dough recipe. And I had this like I woke up one morning, and this is when I was still working on the Australian edition, and I was like oh my God, we're going to be sued because everybody's going to burn themselves on this dough because I like to, I touch really hot things and I'm just, that's just what I do. And I was like, no one is going to want to, everyone's going to burn themselves. So I was like emailing my editor in Australia going, oh my God, we have to change that hot water thing. And that's why now it says just boiled um, hot water. Oh, mine feels a bit too wet actually. Maybe I added, I was too, added too much water. Um, I was like, I don't want to dry dough when I'm making it tonight, but now it just feels way too wet. 
What is, How does yours feel? What is it? This the white rice? Salad? Yeah. I think I'm gonna add more of the, of the sweet rice flour. Your dough looked so amazing, the one you made on Instagram. Yeah, the I love the recipe. Everybody was so excited. It's so good. The other, the other thing to remember about this dough is don't expect to pleat it like a normal dumpling. Because it just doesn't have that elasticity. So we can show you if I manage to get my dough to a workable consistency almost there um we can show you like a couple of ways to do it the way in the book is my 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 favorite kind of um got j dumpling which is the dumpling i grew up with but um the way aaron was doing it on online on instagram was probably the easiest way of doing it um, i don't really know I haven't made many dumplings in my life, so I, I think I'm- No, it's great. <laughs> that looked fantastic. Well, thank you. It took me about a minute per, <laughs> per dumpling, so. All right, I have mine. And it's so smooth. I don't know why mine's so wet tonight. I love how it- Maybe it's this different, I don't know. I've never used this brand of- And that's the other with food and tree flowers. Yeah, the they they can be so inconsistent between yeah. amongst brands. Yeah, so and I, I like to use as finely milled as possible. Same. Some of them are stone ground, and then they don't hydrate this way. So this one is stone ground. This um this particular Bob's Red Mill one, but um, I was before today. I was using the Machico, the Coda Farms Machico brand, which is such a beautiful product um, and if I don't have that I'm going to use the Thai Chinese supermarket brand which is the one I grew up with and it's the one it's got the elephant on the um on its uh, on the packet it's like 79 cents a packet and I buy three every time I go to a Chinese supermarket and that one is really good because it's super fine and actually it's it's quite different. You get a really different result using the, those flowers. Mm -hmm. um, so the dose. I bought a different kind of uh, of rice flour today, the glutinous flour, and I could even yes. um, different color. It was yes. much better than the one I had. Well, mine is ready, and it feels so good. I love it when it's warm and it's still. I know. Like, um, okay, another question that I had as I was rolling my pieces mm -hmm. is that I couldn't get them like really nicely rounded. Yeah, did you use a, a biscuit cutter? Yeah. Is that is that like a sacrilege? No, you can totally do that. And one of the other um, ways it, for wrappers in general is, you know, I roll everyone in, individually and it does take a long time. The other thing, when I started out making my own dumplings, I would roll an entire sheet of dough, like it was pastry, like a pie dough. And then I just cut them out with biscuit cutters. And then you can re-roll the scraps and keep doing that. And it really does save a lot of time. Um, but you know, people, when I do things like this, people always wanna see the rolling. Mm -hmm. This is also like very different to a wheat flour dough because the rolling is almost completely opposite. It's really hard to get, as you said, a neat, a neat circle because it kind of frays around the outside and the fraying will kind of stop you from getting a beautiful edge to the to the dumpling so using a biscuit cutter is is okay. makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um, when you do a an ap flour dough it's a very different process in rolling because you roll the out only the outside of it so you keep rolling the outside and then you have a thicker base in the middle and that's to hold the filling. And then the thinner outside of the, the wrapper allows you to crimp beautifully. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the trick. We kind of don't do that with this, this, this dough just because it doesn't really work. So 
Um, I'm going to go wash my hands. Yeah, me too. Bear with us. Okay. So, so we go rolling a sheet and then cutting it out. Would that be? Oh, that's not what you do. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. She yeah, was, you can. Are you gonna roll? Are you gonna roll it out today? No, no, I'll do how you do. I'm just wondering how how home cooks. Ah. I'm gonna do it. Oh, in terms of the 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 wrappers. Yeah, like if 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 it's. More, you know, if everybody actually rolls individually or. Well, you, it's, I think a lot of dumpling making is establishing a rhythm, right? So the, um, oh, someone just said, didn't say how much psyllium, uh, two teaspoons. And we both used the hus powder. Um, I don't know how I, I just saw that, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a real rhythm to it. You know, like when we, I was growing up, making dumplings was never really done on your own. So there were like two people that my mum would, you know, she would make the dough and then I would like, you know, do some crimping. Um, but you've got to establish your rhythm. Like with this one in particular, the dough dries out quite quickly. So I like to like, so basically we divide this into like four pieces. And then each piece, I mean, depending, the recipe says to divide each piece into, into seven. Um, so you want a dumpling wrapper that is about three and a half inches at least to get a good sized dumpling. If you want bigger dumplings, divide it into just six or five if you want like kind of more mega ones. It's kind of up to you. Um, and you should always cover the dough. The other day when I was making this, the dough got really dry as I was um, doing the, the filling. So I just kind of wet my hands. I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I just kind of wet my hands just to kind of refreshen it a little bit. This is not what we're supposed to do, what I'm about to say. Okay, tell us, we love it. Away from plastic. But sometimes with dough, especially gluten-free doughs that dry out really quickly. Yeah. I have had to use like a small sheet of plastic to, because I, I, I have that with uh, pasta, gluten-free pasta. Yeah. And I make baguettes and things. Um, you know, when you cover it only with linen, it does dry out very quickly. So. Yeah, and somebody did comp made a made a. I think I did a cooking video the other day, and somebody got mad at me for using. I was make I was making noodles, um, so you know a similar kind of idea, and I always wrap it in the plastic because it kind of lets it steam while it rests. And someone got mad at me for doing that, but I don't know a good alternative. So if somebody knows, please let me know. <laughs> I re I save the plastic pieces. Yeah, yeah. I often I'll reuse it. Right. Um, so one, two, three, four, five. And like, I don't, some people measure what, like some people weigh their little balls, but I don't, I can't just kind of feel them and then see if one is heavier than the other, I might like kind of rip some off and add it to. I loved your method of rolling, by the way. I can't, I can't do two. My grandma, cause she was a, you know, a baker. She was like, you have two hands. You have to use them both. Oh, I am using both. Like I am so like I was so impressed by two hand two handed rolling. Okay. So we might. I'm. I mean, I guess that's just make a few to show people because I think we're kind of running out of time. Although I'm actually surprised how far we got. Let's see. I did a demo the other night and I didn't get this far at all. So we've actually been pretty good. So the other thing, where is my roller? I have the little one you gifted me. I yes, love that's, that's a, they call that a wonton roller, but you can use it for dumplings. The other thing about rolling dough um, is particularly, you just not gonna, it's just not gonna work with a big roller. I've seen a lot of people like, when I first started out, I was using like a big roller and I was like, why isn't this working? Because you need control. More so with an AP flour dough, but the thing is, is it's really hard to control a big French rolling pin. So um, yeah, get yourself a small roller. You can get them kind of anywhere. They're, they're super cheap. Um, this is actually from a brand called an Etsy 
maker called the Naughty Dane. Um, and they're, they're super great. They're really, they come in all different sizes. And this is about a one inch, um, one inch roller. The thing with um, rolling surfaces to um, or work surfaces, I find is that if you have a, a marble surface, or, um, what is the fake marble called? Um, oh, like a Caesar stone type of thing. Like those that are smooth are, yeah. you really don't need to use much dusting flour at all. Like if you're, yeah. if you're always perfectly moist and uh, like right now I'm not using any dusting flour, but if I were rolling on a wood surface, that catches, like when I, I made them at home, uh, I, I had to use more dusting flour. Yeah, I don't really have to use much on mine either. Um, so I've got one sheet ready and I'm just gonna put, okay. the other thing about making dumplings when you have it, if you're like kind of a novice and just learning, less is more. So don't try and overfill it with a heap of filling because it's just going to be harder to handle. When you're learning about making dumplings, um, less filling just gives you more hand, the handle, the handling will be a lot easier. So just um, start with a little bit less and as you get more confident, put more in. Um, and how you do it. Are you uh, also like once you, um, you, how would you say it? You meet the ends, like do you? Yeah. Pinch them so to make it thin. Yes, okay. that's right. So I'll pinch them together now. Okay. This is the best dough I've made all week. This is the luck of Aaron coming out. It's the pressure. Yeah. I think I added way too much water, and so but then I added more. So I don't really know <laughs> what the, the, the ratios are now. Um, so then we can do. I'm going to do the one that you were doing first, which is. It's hard to do when you're holding, you, when you're sitting. So what you should do is actually put it down on a surface. So it gets that little seat going. Okay. And then it's probably going to be very hard. I might move this. And then you're just going to kind of create like a Z shape. Is that a good way of describing it? Mm -hmm. And then just kind of crimp them like that. And I'm gonna do it in front of. So that's so okay. it's got that little it's got that little seat, and oh yeah, you beautiful. Yours is better than mine. <laughs> there you go. Mine. Um, somebody messaged me on Instagram too, saying the way I was doing it was incorrect, and I can't remember why. So I need to look back. But she said it has to stand up. And mine weren't fully standing up. This one seems to be that one's standing up. Yeah. And so it's easier to get them to stand up if you do it on a surface because then it's already sitting. Um, the when you do like use um, regular flour, I do that in my hand. But then because that dough is a lot hardier, I then kind of plop it down onto the surface and, you know, shape it. The shaping is kind of less important with a gluten-free dough because you you should probably crimp it on a surface at this point um you don't really cover them like if you're taking a while it doesn't matter right no no and this is the i'm just going to do one more and then i'll kind of cook two to show people but at this point you can freeze them and in fact i have two bags in my freezer right now of gluten-free dumplings oh, um how would you so uh, wrapper if you're not filling them so i have you can um just you flour them but with a starch and this because the starch won't absorb in so you could but you'd have to roll them all so you'd have to roll them all and starch them and then wrap them really well i don't tend to do that because i like i would prefer just having wrapped dumplings in my freezer rather than um rather than dumplings that just just wrappers um i'm going to do this the one that's in the book which is my which is my mum's crimp it's really easy for me but it can be tricky it's basically a pinch okay and and um it's it's got different names some people call it like a rope 
That actually and looks like a Spanish empanada. <laughs> it does. So, and when I was in Argentina, I went to an empanada class and they were quite trying to show people how to do it. And I was like, get out of my way. This is like, <laughs> this is like my thing. I've been doing this since I was a kid. So that's the, um, so that's a traditional one that's from like where my family is from. But, you know, other areas use it too, but the filling could be different. So I'm going to show people what I would do to freeze them quickly before I cook. So I usually have this little tray. It's just the little one. I don't know what size you call this, but it's the tiny one. And I have several of these and I just line it with parchment paper and I'll just put these on there. And once the trays fill, I'll just like dip this into my freezer and you just let it harden up. It doesn't have to be completely frozen, just hard enough so it's not gonna stick together. And then I'll take them out and put them in like a bag or a um, airtight container. So they're really freezeable. They're so great. You know, if you have a session on a weekend, you can make like 30 of them and then just stick them in the freezer. Or like my family will just eat them, but you know. What, tell us about the sauces, the dipping sauces. The dipping sauces. Well, we're not gonna have time to make one tonight, um, but there's different ways. Like we, for example, in Chinese culture, don't always eat dumplings with a sauce. Actually, we just kind of eat them like just like that, mainly with ch um, like a chili sauce. But I know in Western culture, people love their dipping sauces and like my kids like them too. There's different things you can use. Just black vinegar is a, a great one for um, pot stickers. Um, there's a soy based one in the, in the book. Um, there is, and I really wanted to mention this, is this everything oil, which is at the front of the book. It's in the introduction section. This stuff is, people say, what should I cook first? And I say, you should cook the everything oil because it is so good. It's basically my version of a Sichuan style cook, um, chili oil, but it has a lot of spices in there. It's got star anise, um, it's got cinnamon and a lot of like three different types of chili. It's really good. And I will most, most usually just use that with my dumplings. And if you don't have it, like a fly by gin silly chili crisp or something like that is, is works too. You don't have to make it. Also, I know you're going to cook them, but can I say something about your yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know if everybody has all of Hetty's books, but this is the first one she's photographed herself. And they're all film photos. Um, and they are so beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. Like, yeah. it's me that I feel like this book is so... I mean, all, all of your books are really personal, but this one has, you know, like the visual, the words. Yeah. I mean, the, the film photography was something that I thought, uh, it was as soon as I thought of the book, I was like, that's what I want to do because um, I just really wanted this book to feel like you've been invited to someone's home and it was nostalgic and that, you know, like we all remember the old, uh, old film photos from when we were kids, right? Um, so I just kind of wanted to portray that in food. And I don't think that film is used much in food nowadays at all. Um, and I really wanted to show that it could be done. And my publishers luckily were very just open to me doing it and taking a stab. And it was pretty nerve wracking sometimes and scary. So I backed everything up on digital, but I didn't use one digital photo in that book. Um, it was scary. Because you're sending, and I also sent the film across country to this one developing place I loved in San Francisco, and it was being fed, these, these film canisters were being FedExed across country. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorite shots. So and you know, that's um, the orange at the end of the book is really, I mean, everything, all the design, we didn't really have time to talk about the design, but the design is all really intentional, and the oranges um, for me have several different meanings, but you know, often. Um, Chinese people will end a meal with oranges, with citrus or fruit, but a lot of oranges. And my dad ended every meal with an orange. That was his, that was his signature. He'd go and sit down and peel himself an orange. So um, that was kind of like my homage to him. So I'm just gonna cook the two that I've got done because I know we're running out of time. So for, to do the pot stickers, you need to get your pan really hot. I'm actually using a nonstick. This is from Material Kitchen. I have not owned a nonstick pan for forever, but I decided to 
get one and it's pretty good. Um, I don't know if you can actually see it, but you need to get it hot and then you get, you put your hot stickers in. Are you using, I see olive oil. I'm using olive oil. Yeah. I tend to do that uh, because it's just a little bottle. It's the smallest bottle I have. It's easy to hold. And I'm very undisciplined when it comes to what oil. I mean, for everything oil, I would use a neutral oil, although I have made it with olive oil before. It's really delicious. Um, but, you know, this is a good quality olive oil and you can, you know, you can cook it to high temperatures. So basically, you're going to cook that. You. What is your, um, like your mom, what oil would she use? What is like? Uh, um, only like a vegetable or a, um, she uses rice bran oil now because she's, she's trying to be healthy. So rice bran oil is very popular in Australia. Um, so that would be her neutral oil now. And we didn't really get introduced to olive oil till we were like way older. And she, it was always, I was telling some, um, some friends about this, that olive oil in our house was like her special oil because it's expensive and, you know, she would um, put it kind of in its own little spot. So this is like getting nice and golden now. See that that, so when, you, when it's golden, you, sorry, I think I've got everything in front of my pan. We'll turn that just down a bit. Then we're gonna add about a quarter cup of water and have your lid ready. I, I, should, I should make them too. Have your lid ready because it's going to splutter everywhere and put that on. And so this process is now the steaming. So it's basically a steam fry method. I'm just going to move everything out of the way so you can actually see the pan. How many did you make? <laughs> I'm looking for a lid. I don't know if I have one. Or like, like some sort of a board that's not going to get burnt, maybe. I don't know. I just have like a big. Dutch yeah, that'll do. Sometimes I use that one too. Are you using a stainless steel pan? I'm using a nonstick. Oh, okay. I, um, I know people don't like nonsticks. They have a bad rep, but because I'm from Spain and I make Spanish tortilla all the time. Yes, and, and that's one of the reasons. I use cast iron almost for everything. Um, I have a stainless steel, which I also use sometimes. And you can use stainless steel for pot sticks. A lot of people say you cannot use it. It'll stick and you absolutely can. I um, taught this to a friend recently. You just have to heat it till it's really hot. till you see the wisps of smoke coming up and then nothing's going to stick to it. So it's the fact that you do have to heat it up. If you don't, it's, it is going to stick and it's going to be a disaster. And a well-seasoned cast iron pan will basically do any job. I made a, um, you know, the Japanese rolled omelette, the tamagoyaki. People always say to me, you can't make that in a, in a you have to use a nonstick. I use it, I made it in my cast iron just last night. So it's the heat of a pan is really important. Um, and in a lot of Asian cooking, you'll, you'll see like, you know, that's why we use the wok because it heats up so hot and so quickly, actually. So I'm just picking up um, all these tea towels that are on the floor. All right. So that's been steaming for, I'm not quite sure how long, but once you take it off, if there's a bit of... Oh, sorry, this is real life. Um, <laughs> When you take it off, there'll be a bit of liquid left in there and just cook that off. I think actually one of my stuff. Oh no, it's, it didn't stick. Good. The little trick is when you're putting them in, just jiggle them around in the oil. So, you know, the flour kind of steals itself mm -hmm. and then it, it, it won't stick. So I usually do that. Um, I did that kind of on camera recently and I was like, oh, that was terrible to actually just put my hand straight in um, so mine are ready let me get like a little plate okay i'm just going to bring that closer i'm sorry it's very dark in my house right now but um so you really that, 
just like really mine are not getting super yeah yeah oh hot yeah they're hot but that's the bottom okay i'm sorry everything just looks black in my house but it's, it's not as black as it actually looks so there you go there's some gluten-free dumplings we managed to make two. I'm proud of it. I'm proud that we got through the entire process, actually. <laughs> I, I just get to stand here and watch you. Can you see it? I, I'm not very good with this. Okay. They're steaming. I didn't let them go uh, far enough with the caramelizing. So they're going to be a little pale. Someone's asking, should the dumplings be cooked standing up or can they rest on their side? Um, look, traditionally they should be standing up um, because you can rest them on the side, but it means that it's just not gonna look as nice because you want one side to be the, the, the cooked side with the, the, um, the golden bottom. So you can have a golden side, but um, I think on it's easier to do the bottom. The side. <laughs> Are yours on the side? <laughs> <laughs> What a mess. That's all right. Leave leave the lid on. It'll be fine. Leave it leave it on. Uh, are we ready for questions? Yes, I think we're ready. Hey there. I my mouth is watering. <laughs> Those dumplings it's, look delicious. <laughs> it smells really good actually. Okay, we've got a few questions in the Q&A. We're just going to go um, rapid fire. Uh, Gabby asks, can you add vermicelli noodles to the filling? Would that act as a binder? It wouldn't act as a binder, actually. It actually would make it fall apart more. Um, but it is used traditionally in spring rolls. Um, and, but uh, yeah, the binders I are the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, but you can put it in there. Mm -hmm. Good, a good choice. <laughs> yeah, delicious. Um, Lindsay asks, what brand of gluten-free panko do you prefer? Oh, Aaron might have a better answer to this. I, um, I think I have Ian's. I actually have it, hold on. Ian's? Okay, we can come, we can come back to it. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, and then there's a few questions um, asking, about the oh there we go there are ian's gluten-free original panko breadcrumbs perfect amazing amazing um what kinds of herbs did you use i heard you use cilantro there were scallions was there anything else yes i just used um cilantro and scallions but in the book it recommends like dill it, it's one of those things you you can use whatever you i try to do that nowadays is basically mm -hmm. use what's in my fridge to have less wastage but it's a it's a mushroom and herbs so whatever you've got is great okay. parsley would that. go really nice too mm -hmm. yeah parsley would be great mm -hmm. yeah i love the repurposing of the ingredients as well you can <laughs> kind of mix and match based on what you have available or what's in season yes um let's see there was a question about um for frozen dumplings do you mm -hmm. thaw them before cooking or do you cook them from frozen always cook from frozen um it, whether they're store-bought or homemade always cook from frozen because they'll turn into a soggy mess also do not store uncooked dumplings in the fridge they'll they'll just turn to to mush mm -hmm. um but yeah always cook from frozen whether that yours cooking it this way or boiling uh, any of those mm -hmm. methods and you Steaming. do it the same way you've had you add the oil um, yeah, absolutely and, it, and then add in the water cover. the only difference is that it might take a, a you know a 30 60 seconds longer because if the filling is frozen but mm -hmm. the, everything else is exactly the same that's perfect thank you um and there's a question i'm just going to ask a few maybe two more questions um we have a question from sanaya what gluten-free flour brands does aaron recommend <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sponsored by any company, so I, <laughs> I, um, I'm going to be honest. My favorite brand um, depends also on the flower, but in general, I love uh, it's a small company in California called Authentic Foods. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very hard to find because they're family owned. Uh, they mill their own grains, mm -hmm. um, which a oh, lot, wow. there's other companies that package um, 
third miller uh, grains, but they mill, their, they're, they're like triple milled, super fine. All their flowers are super fine. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, I have to order them online. I actually order, because I test so many recipes, I order 50 pound, like the brown rice flour, I order the 50 pound bag. Wow. And then the <laughs> flour is like 25 pounds, sorghum is 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I love, um, I love Bob's Red Mill. I don't, some of their flowers are a little bit too coarse for me. So I don't, but like, I love the, their starches. I like their darker buckwheat flour. It just depends. Um, and there's another company and they are a packager. They're not a miller, but um, it's authentic food or not, not, I said authentic food, Anthony's goods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But their products are really good and very finely milled. Um, and then I love the Coda Farms for the, the, yeah. the rice flour. Uh, that's what I, what I normally- I've got one here. I yeah. love their products. This is the sweet rice flour and you can make mochi with this one. It's so good. Yeah. Thanks for all the great recommendations. Um, all right, we're gonna take just one last question before we wrap up tonight. Um, Amy asks, or Amy says, Anne asks, um, just ordered your book from Bookwater, so excited. Besides the everyday oil, what other recipes should I start with? Oh my God, there's, um. I don't know how to answer that. There are so many good ones. Um, oh, I want to make all the breakfast ones. I was yeah, thinking... the breakfast ones are pretty amazing. The the, the tomato and egg is, um, you know, a very traditional Chinese um, home style dish, and it's something that really reminds me of home. And there's like three iterations of that. It's traditionally just served with rice, um, and I recently did like a recipe for BA, which was a tomato and rice. Um, tomato and egg uh, noodle soup mm -hmm. but in this book it's served with rice noodles um, there's one where it's served with macaroni as a breakfast dish and there's actually a tomato and egg shatsuka so um, that is a good one if you kind of want to get into something that's very traditional but kind of used in a modern way mm -hmm. um, I really recommend the potato and leek momos and you could do that with this recipe but just not with that fold mm -hmm. but the filling itself um, it's a very traditional Nepalese filling and it's just, you wouldn't think to put potato in a dumpling, but it's just so good. Um, so I would, I would recommend trying that for sure. And one other thing, can I just add the oat crisp? It's in the salad section. It's a root vegetable salad with a chili oat crisp. Um, yeah. The oat crisp is like so outstanding. It is so crispy. It has oats and coconut in there. Mm -hmm. and it's gluten-free if you use gluten-free oats and it's just it's, it's mind-blowing so my friends that's actually their favorite I have to like take that to their houses now <laughs> if I'm invited over um this yeah, was it jarred in bulk <laughs> exactly it is so damn good if you like chili crisp give that recipe a go I um I also have to say many when I share the on stories when I was making the dumplings, people asked me if the whole book is gluten-free and it's not necessarily gluten-free, but I feel like probably you can make almost everything gluten-free. Yeah, I think so. There's a, almost the, um, the, the dessert chapter is um, almost entirely gluten-free other than the chiffon cake. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, a brown, there's a, actually a soy sauce brownie that's made with almond flour and it's, pretty fantastic um people are going crazy over it so yeah and the other thing I, I keep getting asked which I just blows my mind is whether it's vegetarian and it is 100% <laughs> vegetarian I'm vegetarian I have been so for many That's many decades um, but I got asked this question several times on Instagram today so it is 100% vegetarian and probably 75% vegan um with vegan i made up this term veganized so this is how you can veganize something um so there's almost recommendations for everything um in the book so yeah, yeah I see you have everything very clearly marked too on um, on all the recipe pages as well yeah and substitutions there's lots of like kind of different ways because that's kind of my mantra in cooking is is like not having too many rules and kind of using what you have um, most ingredients in this book are from your supermarket. Um, mm -hmm. Most supermarkets should have the things that you need. There's probably one or two ingredients you might have to get online or go to your Asian um, grocery store. But um, 
it is like a very egalitarian Asian cookbook. Um, anyone should be able to cook from it. Yeah, well, it's it's beautiful. I mean, you know, like Aran pointed out, I actually didn't realize that um, you had taken so many of these with like with film. Um, that's really impressive and exciting. And yeah, um, I know you. I'm excited to try all of the recipes as a vegetarian myself. So oh yay! Uh, <laughs> congratulations um, on an amazing book um, to Asia with love. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Hetty, and thank you, and Aaron, thanks, Aaron. tonight. Um, I have to release books in order to see Aaron. So <laughs> it's a happy, <laughs> a happy excuse to see each other. Exactly. <laughs> um, for everyone in the audience who attended, thank you again for joining us and um, cooking along with us tonight. Um, the uh, copies of To Asia with Love are available at booklarder.com. We do have signed copies. Thank you, Hetty, for sending us um, book plates for the book. We really appreciate it. Um, and this author talk will be available on our YouTube channel within 48 hours of the event. So if you um, know someone who missed tonight's demonstration and, and would like to rewatch the event, um, you will receive a link in your Zoom post event email. Um, so thank you again. Have a good night, everyone, and happy cooking. Bye, Bye everyone. See you on the Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.